Last week we talked about the intercostal muscles running between the ribs and how they're important in breathing and what they do, how they move the ribs. And this week I said we'd talk about the accessory muscles of inspiration, the accessory muscles of breathing, because they're involved in both inspiration and expiration. And what do we mean by that? Well, we mean essentially any other muscle that attaches to a rib. But first of all, a bit more of the concept. Okay, so when you're breathing uh, easily, you're probably sat at home. I doubt you're out jogging watching this video. Um, your diaphragm is doing most of the work. The diaphragm sits between the thoracic cage and the abdominal cavity. It divides that space up into two. And it's a muscle, a somatic muscle that you can control. And when you contract the diaphragm, the muscle shortens and it pulls down and increases the volume inside the thorax. Increases the volume, decreases the pressure, air gets drawn in through the airway and into the lungs, right? Me, I'm moving my ribs around fairly easily, but I'm controlling the airflow over my vocal cords so I can make a sentence. And I'm probably pulling, pulling in a bigger lung full of air so that I can do that. So I'm using my intercostal muscles. Their, part of their job is to move the ribs, as we talked about last week, in the bucket handle, sorry, bucket handle and pump handle movements of the rib cage in the sternum. And also their main role is to resist those pressure changes that we create by moving the rib cage. So what is it, what do you do when you're really out of breath? If you have asthma maybe and you've had an attack and found it very difficult to breathe before, if you've run a really fast half marathon or maybe a marathon uh, and you're really tired, what, what, what do you do when you finish that race? Um, it, when you see maybe older people who have respiratory difficulties and find it difficult to draw air in or out, or maybe have been finding it difficult to draw air in and push air out over a long period of time. So these muscles that we just talked about are tired. What, what do they do? Well, you do this, don't you? You do this instinctively. You, you grab hold of a table or something and then you can breathe really deeply, but why? It's an instinctive thing. We do it naturally, we don't have to think about it. Well, why do we do that? Well, the reason is that there are muscles running between the upper limb and the rib cage. The rib cage is part of the axial skeleton. The, the, the limbs are the appendicular skeleton. And we have muscles that move the scapula around, for example, and change the angle of the glenohumeral joint that give us this great range of freedom of movement of the upper limb. But if you, if you fix the upper limb in place, you can then use those same muscles to pull in the opposite direction almost. When they contract now, they're not moving the upper limb because the upper limb can't move. You fixed it by holding onto the table. So they pull on the ribs. So suddenly you can recruit really big muscles to pull on the ribs and help you draw air in or push air out. That's the concept. What muscles exactly am I talking about? Can you think of any? I think, um, and we can see, oh look, here's, here's pectoralis major. Pectoralis major is running from the sternum and the ribs here as they enter, as they attach to the sternum. Pectoralis major is running back from the sternum to the upper limb. So if you fix the upper limb, you could use pectoralis major to pull on the sternum. Um, and again, so that's then going to affect, that's, the muscle that you use will depend upon the angle of the humerus in relation to the axial skeleton, the rib cage, as to which muscles are most effective. Um, we've got, pect so if you take pectoralis major off, we see pectoralis minor. Pectoralis minor has got these beautiful slips running from the ribs up to the tip of the shoulder here, up to the up to the shoulder girdle bones, which means again, if you've, if you've locked the shoulder girdle bones in place, you can use pectoralis minor to, I think this is quite a clear illustration, to lift the ribs upwards. When you lift the ribs upwards and outwards, you increase the volume inside the thorax because of the shapes of the ribs. You increase the volume in the thorax, you decrease the pressure, air gets drawn in to equalize the pressure. And then I really like 
serratus anterior. Oh, look, there we go. There's serratus anterior. We can see here serratus because it's like the serrated edge of a knife, right? We've got these big muscular slips running from the ribs and they're running around posteriorly. We can see it a bit more easily on this side. Here's serratus anterior. There's a fair bit of muscle there. It's a big muscle. So it's running to the ribs from the scapula. Um, and normally it's one of the muscles that you know, helps hold the scapula to the thoracic cage and helps move the scapula around uh, and pull the scapula around the thoracic cage and what have you. But in our case today, if you're keeping the scapula fixed in place because you're holding onto something, this huge great big muscle can again pull on the ribs, lift them upwards and outwards in that bucket handle movement and draw air in. So that's serratus anterior. Isn't that great? Really, really nice and really, really big muscles. If we spin around, we can see, hmm, what can we see? Right, well, here's trapezius. Take trapezius off. Trapezius isn't attaching to the ribs. Here are the rhomboids. Take rhomboids off. Those aren't attaching to the ribs either. And we can see this muscle here. So we've taken off uh, latissimus dorsi as well. And this is, well, right. Here we've got serratus anterior. This is serratus posterior inferior. So this is, these are again serrated slips of muscle running to the ribs or running between the ribs and the vertebrae. And you can see, I think, from the angle that these muscles are running at, that when serratus posterior inferior contracts, it's going to pull the rib cage down. So it's going to help you pull the ribs down and inwards, decrease the volume inside the thorax, push air out. Now, the reason I mentioned the rhomboids is that if we could take the rhomboids off, we'd see the counterparts, we'd see serratus posterior superior up here. We need to take off the scapula, we need to take off the rhomboids, and we'd see serratus posterior superior running from the vertebrae to the ribs in the opposite direction. So serratus posterior superior is another muscle that can help elevate the ribs, help pull the ribs up and help with inspiration. Now, it's not just the muscles around the thoracic cage which do this. We need to look in the I might have to take your arm off, is that all right? So we can see a little bit better. Look at these guys here, right. So these muscles here, these are the scalene muscles. Think of the scalene triangle. We've done scalenes elsewhere. The scalene muscles, there are three of them, scalenus anterior, scalenus medius, and scalenus posterior, or anterior scalene, middle scalene, and posterior scalene, whatever you like. Um, these three muscles, look, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're pretty bulky muscles. They run from the cervical vertebrae down to the first and second ribs. Which means that, again, they can directly elevate the rib cage, or at least anchor the rib cage. But they, you can often see this when, you can see another muscle I'm going to talk about in a minute there, but when people breathe in deeply, partly because of the pressure changes that are going on, but I think largely because the muscles are contracting. You can almost palpate the scalene muscles as they contract to help elevate the rib cage. So the scalene muscles are also accessory muscles of inspiration. Um, this guy here, this is um, levator scapula. It's going to pull on the scapula. We won't worry about that right now. It's stabilizing the scapula. Um, all right, let's put your arm back on. This is a real skill, this one, because it's a funky angle. There we go. The other muscle, then, that we could see is this one here. This is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. It's a superficial muscle in the neck. It's a thick, strong band of muscle. But as I'm breathing in really, really deeply, you can do this yourself as well, right? You can palpate this really, really tough muscle on both sides contracting. So it's running from the mastoid process of the skull here. And it's running down to sternoclido. It's running down to the sternum and it's running down to the clavicle. So it's normally involved in, you know, well, if it shortens on one side, it's, you know, it'll, it, it's involved in neck flexion if you're led back and twisting the neck and that sort of thing. But if you keep the head fixed and you contract this muscle, you're gonna elevate the sternum. So the sternocleidomastoid muscle is another muscle, or another accessory muscle of inspiration. And that one's a good one to point out because it's not attaching to the ribs, but it is attaching to the thoracic cage because it's attaching to the sternum. Sternocleidomastoid.
Those are some of the accessory muscles of respiration, which you also might be see labeled as the accessory muscles of inspiration because most of them are involved in inspiration. But don't forget the muscles of the abdominal wall, which are also important in pulling down the rib cage and helping exhalation. So we've looked at some of the muscles and we've talked about that main concept is that a muscle that attaches to the rib cage or the sternum that normally maybe moves another part of the body can instead be recruited to move the ribs or the sternum. Now you've got that concept, you can probably think of and find other accessory muscles of respiration. Um, so these are the muscles that then get added on, you know, so if you're just breathing quietly, you'll use the diaphragm intercostal muscles. But when you're exercising, you start recruiting these muscles, which is one of the reasons everything in your thorax gets so tired when you're running a very, very long distance, which I know quite a bit about, because I've done it. Um, so these muscles all get tired. You recruit these extra muscles to help with breathing. And they also then get recruited if uh, people are having difficulty breathing. The counterpoint to that is that um, of course, um, if you get pathology of these muscles, they might restrict movement of the rib cage and themselves make breathing more difficult. So that's another idea. But that, the concept's the important bit. Hopefully you've met some of these muscles in, when we looked at other regions of the body, when we're looking at, for example, the muscles of the upper limb and back and what have you. But that's the idea, all right? Okay, aim achieved. Uh, see you next week.